All right, I've sent the residents to clinic because I've gone overtime as usual. This happens every Friday when I do these. I just can't do 20 plus cases in an hour and 15 minutes. It seems like uh, uh, breaks the laws of uh, physics, um, at least my laws of physics. Here we have uh, mucosa. It's stratified squamous epithelium. And in the surface here, once it comes into focus, we'll see it does not have a stratum corneum. It does not have a granular layer. Sometimes when you get irritation of squamous mucosa, it will get a little granular layer and or a little bit of uh, perikeratosis or thick orthokeratin on top. So, uh, but usually in its normal state, you do not see a granular layer and you do not see um, uh, a corneal layer on top. Also, to tell us it's mucosa, you don't see adnexal structures like um, hair follicles, all right? And then the third thing that helps us is uh, squamous mucosa um, usually has increased glycogen content, so it gives this pale, washed out appearance to the keratinocytes. They look very pale and different, uh, whereas in the skin, the keratinocytes are much more dense pink uh, cytoplasm and not so pale. Okay, so that's a, a little quick rundown of how to tell uh, squamous mucosa, stratified squamous mucosa, like you'd see on the lip, in the mouth, um, in part of the, uh, in the esophagus, and also in the, um, the uh, vagina or the labia minora or the anus. Those are most of the sites that have squamous mucosa normally, okay? So in this case, uh, I'll tell you we're in the lip of the, of the mouth. Um, and uh, you have squamous mucosa, and down here you have abundant skeletal muscle bundles. So that's how we know we're probably either in the lip or the cheek, the internal uh, buccal side of the cheek, or in the tongue, although the tongue will have much more abundant skeletal muscle that usually fills the entire area uh, underneath the squamous mucosa, all right? So that's kind of how we can sort out where we likely are. Um, if instead of skeletal muscle, we had, say, smooth muscle bundles, here and then squamous mucosa, then we'd probably be like in the vagina or the labia minora, okay? Um, so here we go. Down here though, we have another finding that tells us we're in the lip probably, and um, that is this structure here as it comes into focus. And this uh, multinodular um, aggregate of small glands is a minor salivary gland, and these glands are um, made of small acini that have uh, cells with abundant blue mucin. So these are mucinous cells making little acinar structures that cluster together into little lobules. And then those little lobules drain into uh, ducts of increasing size and the ducts are layered, uh, are made of, lined by a, a double layer cuboidal lining. Small salivary ducts have a double cuboidal lining. As you get into larger ducts, the inner lining gets more columnar. Um, to my recollection, I'm not a head and neck pathologist, but that's my memory of it. I hope I'm telling you that right. But uh, the uh, about the only places we see double layer cuboidal epithelium in pathology is in salivary ducts and in eccrine um, or apocrine sweat gland ducts. So when you see a double layer cuboidal, two layers of round nuclei, lining an empty space, sometimes filled with a little bit of secretion, then you know that you're dealing with either a salivary duct or a sweat duct, okay? So there's some normal histology knowledge for you. And these, because we've got the little mucinous acini, we know that these are um, salivary and they're minor salivary glands in this case. And what's happening here? Let's, let me go back to low power again. Over here, right next to our intact salivary, uh, minor salivary glands, we have a large dilated cystic space. It is surrounded by a layer of fibrosis and maybe a little bit of granulation tissue and some mixed inflammation. And it is not lined by a true epithelial lining. At first glance, you might think so, but actually these are histiocytes, okay? If you weren't sure, you could do a keratin immunostain to help you decide that these are truly not epithelial cells. Instead, these are histiocytes, and they have puffy cytoplasm that gives them the appearance of epithelial or epithelioid cells at first, but they're not arranged in a nice, organized, tightly uh, connected layer like a true epithelium would be. They're kind of haphazardly arranged here and compressed together to give you kind of a pseudo epithelium, but they're actually histiocytes. And if we go closer, it may not show up nicely on this scan, but they have a bubbly or frothy cytoplasm. That's because these are filled with the myxoid mucinous material, and that is actually mucin from the salivary gland secretion. That mucin that is made by the minor salivary gland gets put into a larger salivary gland duct. Sometimes those ducts get uh, clogged and ruptured. Sometimes you can actually see a portion of the large duct 
impacted by dried up hardened concretions of, of salivary secretion um, uh, called a sialolith. It may get calcified sometimes. And those can, can obstruct the duct, leading the duct to enlarge, distend, fill with mucinous material, and eventually rupture. And the ruptured duct, the mucin uh, secretion spills out, makes a cystic space here in the adjacent soft tissue. And that space gets surrounded by fibrosis and reactive changes, some granulation tissue here, reactive blood vessels, uh, lymphocytes, histiocytes, some neutrophils, and variable amounts of histiocytes that sometimes are filled with mucinous um, material, and those are sometimes called mucifages. And those mucifages may fill the space, or they may line up and layer along the edge. The reason I'm telling you all these different variations is because from case to case, this can vary. Sometimes you'll see the duct here, and it's beautiful. Sometimes all you'll see is the fibrosis and a little bit of mucifage and a little empty space. And here the space is empty. You can't actually see the mucin here because it washed out and washed away during tissue processing in the laboratory, okay? So that's why when you don't see the mucin, you need to depend on all these background findings. If I see a nodule on the lip and I see some histiocytes in an empty space and it's near some minor salivary, I'm going to suggest that it's probably a mucosil. So this, I can't remember. Maybe I didn't mention the name yet. Sorry, if I didn't, the, the diagnosis here is called mucosil, or sometimes people will call this mucus extravasation phenomenon. The mucus is is um, coming out of the duct. I, I always think of extravasation as meaning coming out of a vessel, but uh, but here we use the same word for for um, for. I mean, uh, extravasation I use for blood cells coming out of a blood vessel, but I guess we can use it for other things too. It's coming out of a ductal space here. Mucin is spilling out. So in any case, here you can see nice mucy pages layered around the edges, and they're beautiful mucy pages floating in the uh, center of this space here. All right. You could confuse these potentially with xanthomatous cells. I feel like the, the, the xanthomatous cells have much more uh, sharply defined vacuoles and they're more clear. Um, uh, but I feel like they do look pretty similar. Uh, foamy histiocytes with lipid versus foamy histiocytes with mucin material in them can look pretty similar here. But in this case, the context and all the other findings tell us this is a mucosil. So a nice, perfect example of one, but sometimes you won't get such a perfect uh, sample as we see in this case.